This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, through, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. This is the word of the Lord. So I'm not usually a creature of habit, but I have tried to establish some patterns in my life. And one of the things that I do every single weekday is, well, every night I make sure that my coffee maker is set to go off at 5.50 because I get up at 6. And so coffee maker goes off at 5.50. I come downstairs a little bit after 6, get up at 6, and walk downstairs, pour my coffee every morning in, in this, now in, the, in this Yeti tumbler that I have. And I sit in my, the same chair in my family room. It's this old rock, padded rocking chair. And I sit there, and because I'm a suburbanite, I just I flick on my fire, you know, make myself a fire. And, uh, and I sit there, and, and I read the Bible. It's like my quiet time with God, and I need that um, before anyone else gets up. That's what I do. And, and I, I, I struggled with sort of like, oh, I know I should spend more time in the Word, a regular time in the Word, but I'm just such not a morning person, hence the lifeline called coffee to me. And so just by God's grace, I've been able to establish this pattern because I, I found my soul needs that. I, I want the reality of God's glory and his grace to set the trajectory for my mind and for the rest of my day. Not what's happening with Trump and Pelosi. I, like, I, I, don't, I don't need that first thing in the morning. I, I just don't need that. But I'm so often tempted to first check social media or the news or even the weather app, and I'll end up watching a video of an alligator strolling across a Florida golf course. And before I know it, like my kids are waking up and they're coming downstairs and I've ruined my quiet time. And my soul feels malnourished because I've been eating junk food for my soul instead of nourishing myself on the living word of God. So this is part of my, my process of thinking in the morning and, and what I do so that I can set my mind on the things above and not immediately on all the things that are vying for our attention. And there have been times that I have been successful in that and there have been times when I failed in that. But I don't live my life legalistically. And I would not say don't, have a daily quiet time. Like that's old school, but we, I was talking with some friends, like that's like a normal thing Christians should do. And so I don't say that so you feel guilt, but to, it's an invitation. God invites us to spend time with him. And he is the greatest and most glorious reality in the universe. And, and that invitation is there for us. And when I spend that time with him, I find myself set on the right trajectory for the day. But like I said, the problem for me, and I'm sure for you too, is that it's so easy to let outside forces direct our minds and dictate to us in a sense like what we should be thinking about and what we should be caring about, right? Something's always vying for your attention. The world is screaming, pay attention to this. Like we talk about clickbait, like clickbait articles, almost everything is clickbait in the sense that the news is really, they're, they're just trying to get us. They, they want to get our attention. Pay attention to this. Hey, this is really important. Hey, you need to see what we're saying right now because this is somehow important for your life. An example of this would be the, the, the countless numbers of talk talk shows, you know, talk, radio talk shows. And this is constant churning out of political news just over and over by the minute. It's just vying for our attention, ready for our constant consumption. And one of the results or the effects of this constant bombardment toward us is that our sense of the bigness of God and what he's doing in the world and through the church grows smaller and smaller to us, while other concerns of the world and its institutions grow larger and larger in our minds and imaginations. And what we can unfortunately allow to happen is to elevate things that may be significant in the world. I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're insignificant, but allow them to be elevated to a place of prominence. Like, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what's really important. And what I'm saying is, is that there's a fight for our focus on the things of God and to see what he is like and what he's doing in the world. And it's not that the things of the world aren't significant. 
The problem is when we let those things overshadow our sense of the significance of what God's doing in the world, in particular through the church. For me, as the week goes on, I feel like my spiritual vision gets blurred and things get out of focus. And I praise God because I get to come back in here every Sunday and it's like, God, um, you know, when you take like a, like binoculars and, and, you, and you twist the dial and, and, it, and it comes into focus and you can see clearly, like that's what Sunday morning is for me. That's what time together with his people and his word and in worship and in baptism, it, it's like, it's clarifying. It brings things back into focus so my spiritual vision is clarified. So on Imprint Bothell's second birthday, I want to help us see through God's word, the massive significance of the church. You might even say that the cosmic significance. It's cosmically significant what we are doing here today. And I want the word of God to remind us of this because my heart needs it, my spiritual vision needs it, and I would assume that you also could benefit from it too. I want, us to, I want to help us feel the privilege, feel the privilege that it is to belong to the body of Christ and to be here. And it, it is a privilege. We need spiritual eyes to see the true weight of things and give the proper weight to the right things in the right kinds of ways. And what's eternally weighty is what God's doing through the church, which I said has cosmic significance. And so that's why I'm taking a detour out of John, the Gospel of John, this week. And I'll pick, and I'll, I'm skipping the passage that we were supposed to be. And I would encourage you, because we're one church in two locations, love Pastor Darren, faithful man of the word, and he's preaching a message on that right now. And I get to detour because I, I just can. And, uh, and so I'd encourage you on our app, check out Darren's message on John chapter 10, the last part of John 10. But we're going to look at this passage in Ephesians 3, which reveals this amazing truth. God displays the wisdom of his triumphant grace in the universe through the church. God displays the wisdom of his triumphant grace in the universe, not just in the world, but in the universe through the church. And the passage that we're looking at today is part of a long parenthetical statement that Paul makes in Ephesians 3. So if you start out in the beginning of the chapter, he says, and for this reason, and he's like, assuming you know these things, and he goes on for a while. And then if you get down to verse 14, he's like, and for this reason, it's like, oh yeah, it's like he's so caught up in the wonder of what he's been called to do as an apostle. And so this is what he tells us about the aim of his ministry in this sort of aside parenthetical remark in verse 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, because he was a persecuted, he was a persecutor, now a proclaimer of Jesus, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable there means incomprehensible, infathomable. Unfa- is that the word? Unfathomable. Incapable of being searched out. In other words, the riches of Christ are so expansive that you can't possibly comprehend their magnitude. Which is why a couple of places in Ephesians, Paul is praying for God's help for the saints to be able to see how much they have in Jesus. Because we just can't take it in. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You just can't take it in. And so we need God's help to see how great the riches are, the treasures are that we have in Christ. Now, when you think about the treasures of Christ or the riches of Christ, we think about the gospel, and many people think that the gospel is this, is like, confess your sins to God so that you can be forgiven and you can go to heaven. Are those things true? They are true. But being forgiven, while essential, is only really the first step. The gospel is more than having your sins forgiven. That's the first part, because what that forgiveness does, because of what Jesus has done for us, is it reconciles us. When we confess our sins and he forgives us, then that wall of separation between us and God, is brought down, and we are now reconciled to God. We now have peace with God, which then just unleashes upon us grace upon grace, lavishes. And if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, actually, he says, in the coming ages, ages and eons, God is going to lavish his grace upon us, the immeasurable riches of his grace. So these unsearchable riches, they begin with forgiveness. There's reconciliation, which is also to us the promise of being adopted into God's family forever, where he becomes our loving father, and we become his sons and daughters. So the unsearchable riches of Christ, I mean, we could go on and on. This is what Paul gave his life to, and if God lets me, then I'll be up somewhere at some point regularly and just going, here's more riches, here's more riches, so that we see what's here. I mean, it's being promised his sustaining grace for every day of your life here, every day, every time you encounter trial, It's the promise, as we talked about in in baptism, of receiving a glorified resurrection body in the next age. No more suffering. 
No more sin, no more depression, no more disease, no anxiety. No deprivation, no loss, no tears, no death. God himself will wipe every tear from our eyes. Only everlasting joy in his presence. That's the promise for us for all eternity. And more. In the ages and ages to come, he will continue to lavish his kindness upon us. I can't even, I don't even know how to think about that. Other than to say, that's what Paul says, that's what God's word says, and that's our future. It is glorious. It is glorious. It's unsearchable. It's unfathomable. It's incomprehensible. That's his aim is to preach this. And then a related aim, he tells us in verse 9 of his ministries, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. In Paul's writings, mystery means something previously concealed by God, now revealed by God. So the question is, what is it that God's now revealing through Paul's preaching? Well, if ever you're studying the Bible and and you're not sure about something, just go to the wider context and see if you can find some clues. And in the wider context, in this passage, we know what this mystery is. He tells us in verse 6. It's not always this clear, but it's clear here. This mystery is that the Gentiles, in other words, non-Jewish people of the nations, not just ethnic Israel, not just the nation of Israel, are fellow heirs, inheritors, members of the same body, the church of Jesus, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, if we think back in biblical history, Israel was God's chosen people. That the revelation, his special revelation to his people that was to Israel, the covenants, the promises, the worship, all of those belonged to Israel. But the saving plan of God always included the full inclusion of the nations, the Gentiles, into the family of God. So yes, Israel had a special and privileged place. But God was always telling them that you're going to be a light for the nations. Like one day, the nations are going to worship God. It's in the Old Testament. But they didn't know exactly how that was going to happen. But if you remember, God had promised Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, that through his offspring, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So there's this promise of global, worldwide blessing. And the question is, well, how is that going to happen? Nobody knew exactly. And then one day, Jesus was born. Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, was born into the world. And the gospel is the good news of his life, death, and resurrection that now goes out to the nations through his followers to make more followers. So do you see how this promise to Abraham and the blessing of the world and of the nations, including the Gentiles, is going to be happening? Yeah, it's through Jesus and his work of salvation on the cross through his life, death, and resurrection and us taking that good news to the nations. And then those who trust in him will receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life, including Gentiles. And now, Gentiles, and and if you are not ethnically Jewish, then you are a Gentile. And if you are a believer in Jesus now, then you are a full member of the church and an an heir of all the promises that have been given to the people of God in the scripture here. Full partakers in the promise of God. Now, we ask the question, what's the reason Paul is preaching the riches of Christ and bringing to light the plan of God to save the Gentiles? What's the reason? Well, you can see it in verse 10 in this little clause, so that, so that there's there's a purpose statement. So he's preaching this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Manifold is not a word that we use too often. It means many-sided, varied, or diverse. Multifaceted like a diamond. It's got many sides to it, many angles to it. So God's wisdom is manifold. It's it's diverse and varied in its forms. So so through the church, God is revealing this multi-sided, multifaceted wisdom. To what or to whom? To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. To what? To whom? Like, that's a confusing verse. And I I, I debated, should I preach this passage? This is a bit confusing. Yes, because he's saying something here. And I want want us to look at this. Context, again, is key. Who are these rulers and authorities? He's talking about human rulers? Well, if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, it gives us some clarity. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities. Same words. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Same phrase, heavenly places, as in verse 10, chapter 3. The rulers and authorities are supernatural beings in Satan's army who are warring against God and against God's people. And Paul uses the same title of rulers and authorities, if you remember Colossians 2.15, where he says this about the cross of Christ. He, that is God, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So God's saving grace through Christ 
triumphed decisively over Satan and all demonic powers at the cross, where Jesus gave his life in our place for our sins. And God, it appears, is continuing to display for these rulers and authorities the wisdom of his triumphant grace. I'm adding the word triumphant so that we know that God is winning. His grace is winning. It's triumphant in the world. And God is displaying this to these supernatural beings on Satan's side through us, the church. The existence of this church and all other churches that that are part of Jesus is evidence of God's triumphant grace. Is it not? When we are baptizing here, is that not evidence of his grace triumphing in people's lives, pulling them out of darkness, pulling them out of lostness, and bringing them into new life? So So us here, if we are in Christ, You are a trophy of his triumphant grace displayed into the world and because we are the church beyond the world and into the cosmos. That's why I add the word universe. It's on display to not only evil beings in the universe but also to angels. In this fascinating verse in 1 Peter 1.12, it was revealed to them that he's speaking of Old Testament prophets that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you believers, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. You see that? The word for long literally means to have intense desire for something. Now think about this. Angels live in the unspeakably glorious presence of God in the heavenly places. So they've got a pretty good view of amazing things from where they are, right? And yet, they're still fascinated by the gospel. They're still fascinated by what God is doing in the world through the gospel of Christ. They are eagerly watching the wisdom of God's grace in Christ unfold in the world. So you have evil supernatural beings that are are, are being shown this manifold wisdom of God and what he's doing through his triumphant grace. And you have angels also looking at this and going, this is amazing. So the reason I bring this up is so that we understand that what is happening here, this is not a human institution. This was not my conception. If not for God, I wouldn't be here. I don't even know where I would be. But I know I wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't be here. Because the church was not man's idea. The church is God's idea. It is a redeemed people. And through it, he is displaying his manifold wisdom in the world. The world doesn't look at Imprint Bothell and see God's wisdom. Nor am I trying to get their approval. But we got to understand that. This is not wisdom to the world. The world says, you study and preach the words of an ancient book? This is what you give yourself to? This is what you pay that guy on the stage to do during his week? Is study this and come on a Sunday and yell at you? Hopefully in a positive way? That's archaic and, and foolish. That's embarrassing. No, it's the wisdom of God. And the world says, you tell people they can have eternal life through trusting in a homeless rabbi who was murdered on a cross 2,000 years ago? Are you serious? That's crazy talk. No, that's the wisdom of God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1. God's way of seeing things, wisdom and foolishness, it's not like the world's. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 30 to to the believers in Corinth. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that is, those things that are exalted, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What's foolish by worldly standards and of no account, totally insignificant, is actually the wisdom of God's saving plan through Jesus. It's a plan that God had long before he even created the world. You see that in verse 11. It says, This was according to the eternal purpose or plan that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Implication is this. What God's doing in this church, this church, right now, right here, in these lives here, is part of his eternal plan for us in Christ. Eternal plan. This salvation was planned out. And God set his affection on you before the world ever began. And he chose you for salvation. Because of this, Paul says in verse 12, that in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. 
So those who trust in Christ have been given unlimited access, unlimited access to the unfathomable riches of Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says this, wonderful verse. Let us then, and if you go back a little bit further, because Jesus has gone before us and opened the way for us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So we can come into the presence of the living God. I mean, I can read over that verse so many times and just fly over stuff like that. Just fly over it. And I go, I need to slow down. And Sunday gives us an opportunity to slow down and go, wait. Like, when we're singing here, we're being invited into the presence of the living God. The creator of heaven and earth, the one who has existed from all eternity and from eternity past, planned our salvation and for us to be here today, to know him, to worship him, to come into his presence, to have access to him, right? For mercy and help in a time of need. And what greater help is there? And how easy it is for me when I hit the bumps and I hit the, the opposition in my, my life and I go, I just, I forget what kind of God God is. That he is a helper. That if he is on my side, then who can be against me? And I, I I just confess, I need to believe this. I get up here and I, and, and I preach this and I go, God, help me to believe this. Help us to believe that you are the kind of God that you say you are. Welcoming helpless sinners into his presence that we might receive mercy. And find grace to help in a time of need. There's no greater help. So God, bringing condemned and helpless sinners to himself to give them life and to love them, and to help them, this is triumphant grace. This is triumphant grace, and it's on display in the universe through his church, through this church. Hopefully in Bothell, hopefully in our community here, but let's not forget that God is doing above and beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. If you keep reading, then Paul says he actually prays for the believers, that we would know that God is able to do abundantly beyond whatever we could ask or imagine. And I wonder in some way if that's connected to the fact that we're going, really, through this little thing here that's happening, you're going to display your triumphant grace in the cosmos? To Satan and his minions and to your angels who are longing to look into this grace? He's going to do this through here, through us? Yeah, yeah, that's the promise. So on our second birthday, let's rejoice and let's celebrate. That's the corporate level. Maybe on the personal level today, you need to know I am being invited into the presence of the living God. And if you have never gone into the presence of the living God with confidence, you don't know who he is, you're unsure about your state with him, then you don't have to do anything to clean yourself up. The invitation is to come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive a new life. And then become an inheritor, an heir of all these great promises. And become a part of a redeemed people, a sinful fallen people, yes, but redeemed, whom God has set his affection on. And he will set his affection on you and invite you in. So may we respond to his grace with rejoicing. You may respond to his, his grace personally with a commitment to say, I'm going to come into God's presence and I'm going to thank him for who he is and for what he's done. He has been exceedingly good. He has been so good to us. Let's pray. Lord God, it is true that the riches in Christ are unsearchable. They're incomprehensible. And Lord, if uh, you should allow us to live more years, many more years on this earth, I pray we would give ourselves to plumbing the depths of your riches, knowing that we're never going to reach the bottom. We're never going to reach the bottom. Even for the ages and ages to come, you will continue to lavish your immeasurable, boundless grace upon your people. I don't know what that looks like. I feel like we just get a little bit of a foretaste here in your word. And I thank you that regardless of our inability to sense the full weight of your triumphant grace for us, um, it is nevertheless promised, nevertheless promised to us. So help us to trust in your word. Thank you for what you have been doing through this church over the last couple years. God, this is your thing, and uh, I just want to be a servant to you. We want to be servants of Christ, not to make a name for ourselves in any way. God, we're nobodies. We're like the Corinthians. Not, we're not noble people. Um, we're not looked upon favorably by the world, and, and, and we're look, what we do here is considered foolish. And yet, this is the very wisdom of God and the unfolding of your saving plan, which you are reverberating out into the cosmos. And I thank you for that encouragement for us and what we're doing here. God, we praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name.
Amen.